Okay, so welcome all to New Perspectives, which is an Integral Yoga platform sponsored, as many of you may already know, by Aro University in Surat, India, as well as two sister organizations, Sri Aurobindo Integral Life Center, which is in Surat, as well as here in Fountain in South Carolina. And I'm Rade, I'm the director of the Center in Fountain Inn, and joined as always by Dr. Vladimir Yatsenko, also with our Center, and also our esteemed speaker for today's webinar. Uh, Vladimir has an MA in Sanskrit Language and Literature, General and Theoretical Linguistics, and a PhD in Indian Philosophy. He is a researcher and instructor in the field of Vedic and Vedantic studies, philosophy of language, and integral yoga psychology. So today, uh, during the next hour, he is going to share a topic that is very, very important uh, to him and one that he has been uh, pursuing for, for many years. Um, and this is on the topic of the faculties of consciousness, those being seeing, hearing, thinking, speaking, and feeling. And these are the instrumentations by which consciousness operates in this world. It is these faculties which allow us to function in the physical body, and they are representatives of Purusha, our consciousness. So in this webinar, Vladimir reviews how the faculties of consciousness were seen by the ancient Vedic rishis and how we deal with them in integral yoga. Uh, there will be plenty of time for questions towards the end of the hour. So uh, as always, please uh, type any of the questions you may have for Vladimir throughout his webinar in the Q&A box below uh, rather than in the chat box. And so with that, Vladimir, I will hand it over to you. Thank you, Radha. Right. Uh, the, the topic is profound and um, it was discovered by me many years back when I studied Upanishads and I looked into the texts and I was surprised that all the Upanishads are dealing directly with the faculties of consciousness. Faculties of consciousness, that is the word we use for Indriyas, because Indriyas, as Sri Aurobindo would say, are infinite. And they are pervading not only this, gross world, but also subtle worlds. They are coming from the subtle levels, higher levels of consciousness. And um, as we know in Sankhya, Purusha, when he attends to Prakriti, Prakriti begins to manifest the Purusha, mixing her gunas and creates buddhi and all the levels one by one till the Karmendriyas and Jnanendriyas are being manifested. And Jnanendriyas are the levels of what we know as Indriyas, yes, as senses. But uh, they are the result of Purusha's uh, attention to Prakriti. And that is something uh, which is usually Mm, misunderstood. We do not see that relation between Purusha and Prakriti. We do not see that the senses are the Purusha's faculties. And then in the Upanishads, it's very beautifully described, very vivid uh, um, kind of expositions we have in Aitareya Upanishad, where it is said that all the faculties came out of Purusha consciousness. Yeah? So one by one. So first Atman manifests the worlds, splits the upper and lower ocean, creates the space in between, and then he populates this manifestation, this world, this bubble, with uh, the faculties of Purusha. First, he pulls Purusha out of the lower waters, and then he applies to it its force and he, its energy, consciousness, tapas, uh, and Purusha breaks forth. His mouth broke forth. Tasya mukham nerabhidyata mukha dvakvachognih. His mouth broke forth from his mouth, speech from the speech, fire. His nostrils broke forth from the nostrils. Prana, the breath from Prana, Vayu was born, wind. Uh, his eyes broke forth from his eyes, sight came into being, and from the sight seeing, and the sun was born. 
and so on. So his ears broke forth from ears, hearing from hearing, space came into being, that Dishaha, the directions of space. So one by one, the whole universe manifested through his faculties of consciousness. And that is quite interesting because the faculties determine the universe. What is required in this universe was um, uh, determined by the faculties of Purusha. He wanted to hear, that's why space came into being. He wanted to see, that's why light was born. The light itself is a representative in the physical world, the representative of the consciousness of seeing. So, um, and it's quite obvious then when we start looking in this way, that all the animals, all the creatures, uh, starting from insects and even from the smaller organisms, bacteria, they have the faculties of consciousness inbuilt in them, which do not have yet totally developed organs, but the organs are coming up slowly through the evolution of consciousness. So, starting from amoeba, the monocellular organism, which wanted to communicate, have you seen the picture of the, of the cell? It's quite interesting. Cell in itself is the whole universe. So that small universe enclosed within the, the body which does not have yet organs, which could represent these faculties, is starting to build these faculties gradually over a long period of time over the, this evolution of consciousness. And finally, we arrive at this body, which developed all the organs, the eyes, the ears, the speech, the tongue, the brain, the nervous system, all this is built for one particular reason, that is to embody the faculties of consciousness, to give the embodiment to the Purusha. Purusha, universal Purusha, becomes embodied in the individual form. And in this way, if you look at the, our physical existence, our material existence, it is actually mm, has a meaning only in the functioning of these faculties. They are to bring more knowledge, more light, more relations, more understanding. Um, and that is how we evolve. So, this is just an introduction. Then I looked into uh, into the Upanishadic texts, and I found a very convincing way of dealing with these faculties. It is throughout. You open any Upanishads, just take the book, open Upanishads, and put your finger on, you will find these major faculties. Annam pranam chakshuk shrotram mano vacham iti. These six major faculties, that is the body, the physical embodiment, prana, the vital force, or the feelings, emotions, sensations. We split them in three. Then we find the mental activities, the mind, which has the power of concentration, holding any image of things. Then we have the speech, which can express the being in a particular way, in subjective way, bring some mm, uh, intentions into play. And uh, then we have seeing and hearing. These are the major faculties. So. Uh, seeing and hearing, as Shibinda says, these are the major faculties of consciousness. Seeing sees the form, and hearing understands the meaning of the form, how this form relates to other forms. Um, one is apprehensive cognition, recognizing the form, other is comprehensive cognition, which understands how this form relates to other forms. So in this way, we could see that consciousness is not an abstraction of some kind of abstraction, which we are usually dealing with in, um, in the common sense. We, when we speak about consciousness, we always mean something, some kind of awareness. 
uh, which we do not relate to our faculties and senses. But um, it is not so. Upanishads do not deal with abstraction of this term, of this concept of consciousness, only with the faculties. And that is quite interesting. Uh, then I started to look into Sri Aurobindo's uh, yoga and and uh, savitri, and I took from him quite um, a number of things. And I will show you a few examples that these faculties are not only related to our physical body, but they also relate to our vital, mental and even over mental and even supramental body. You can find this all in Savitri, how Sherbindu speaks in these terms. So here we are. Mm. Uh, there are some, I just chose a few quotations from Savitri in there to show you how Sherbindu deals with consciousness in a very similar manner as Upanishads. In the witness occult rooms with mind-built walls, on hidden interiors lurking passages opened the windows of the inner sight. The, opened the windows of the inner sight. There is an inner seeing. He owned the house of undivided time, lifting the heavy curtain of the flesh, a heavy curtain of our body embodied state. He stood upon a threshold serpent watched. Some watching is taking place and peered into gleaming endless corridors. This is the faculty of consciousness to see, to uh, in the gleaming corridors, silent and listening in the silent heart. Silence itself is a state of consciousness which is recognized by the faculty of hearing. When we hear the silence, we hear it. For the coming of the new and the unknown, he gazed across the empty stillnesses, the seeing faculty and heard the footsteps of the undreamed idea. He was listening, hearing the footsteps. And in the far avenues of the beyond, he heard the secret voice, the word that knows. This is the faculty of the word, which is expressing the highest being, and saw the secret face that is our own. These are the highest uh, experiences on the highest plane of consciousness. And all the faculties are present there. I will give you some more examples uh, here from about the word, how he's using in the same manner as in the Rig Veda. The voices that an inner listening hears conveyed to him their prophet utterances and flame-wrapped outbursts of the immortal word and flashes of an occult revealing light approached him from the unreachable secrecy. So that unreachable secrecy reaches out to him with the flame-wrapped outbursts of the immortal word, with the flashes of an occult revealing light. A sudden messenger from all-seeing tops traversed the soundless corridors of his mind, bringing her rhythmic sense of hidden things. A music spoke transcending mortal speech as if from a golden file of the all bliss, a joy of light, a joy of sudden sight, a rapture of the thrilled undying word poured into his heart as into an empty cup, a repetition of God's first delight creating in a young and virgin time. 
So these are the movements of the higher consciousness, of the higher being through the faculties to reach out and to embody the faculties and the powers which are not yet embodied here in the body. And so on and so forth. Sight was a flame thrown from identity. Life was the marvelous journey of the spirit feeling a wave from the universal bliss. So these are the faculties we are talking about. These are the senses which we always overlook and we never deal with. They are the, the bridges, they are the, the mediators of the spirit to this world. And these mediators are embodied in the body. We can see the eyeballs, the ears, we hear the speech, we have the nervous system. It's all embodied in the physical sense. So, here is the vision of the Upanishads where the major six faculties are presented. I usually give this scheme because it's quite um, interesting. Um, it does not belong to the Sankhyaic paradigm to the later time. It is a part of the pre-Sankhyaic, pre-rational paradigm, where the faculties of consciousness represent consciousness directly. They are not yet, how to say, indriyas dependent on the sense mind, manas. Manas is one of them. Manas is a part of this system. So here we can see that uh, we have hearing and speaking on one side, so if you look at this, we could see clearly that on one side we have uh, hearing and uh, speaking as the representative of this hearing. Hearing and speaking. Speaking is an active counterpart of hearing. Speaking is a vibration which we produce and by vibrating which we express ourselves and communicate with others. They hear us, they understand what we want. And seeing is the form. So, and uh, when the, the, we see any form, we, we also may imagine the form. So if we actively seeing the form, that means we apply the mind and the mind, thinking mind, thinking is imagining, is moving the shapes of, uh, of the form, whatever form. By the way, Shubindu says that the thoughts are of only two kinds. One is uh, in the imagining the form and the other is in the uh, word. So we can think by words and we can think by forms. So um, on one side we have a rupam, the form. On the other side, on the right side, we have the nama, the name. So the name and the form, these two manifested the Brahman in this world. And the Brahman is manifested as a living force, prana, and is embodied as matter. So matter is nothing but the embodiment of a living power of the spirit with the help of two major cognitions, apprehensive and comprehensive of hearing and seeing, of speaking and thinking. And these are the constant dvandvas, dvandvas dualities in the Upanishads. They speak about them in these dual terms as manas and vak, that means thought and speech, and chakshuk and shrotram, seeing and hearing and prana and apana, or prana and annam. These are three major dvandvas, which represent the spirit. So all of these six are represented not only on the physical level, as our organs, so to say, we have the organs of seeing, of hearing, we have the tongue, we have the mind uh, embodied in the system of our brain and heart, and we have the, the whole torso with all the emotions, plexus solaris, and all the chakras of the subtle body, 
representing the living, the emotions, uh, feelings, and sensations within this physical body. And we have the body, Annam, that material formation which embodies the life force and which embodies all the faculties within itself. This is on the physical level. When we move to the vital level, we have the same representatives. We can see on the vital plane, we see our dreams, we can think on the vital plane, we can feel very strongly on the vital plane, we can um, hear, uh, we can speak on the vital plane. And on the mental plane, there are also these faculties. There are There is conceptual thinking, there is a seeing, mental seeing, which is understanding or viewing different concepts and selves. There is a hearing on the mental plane as understanding of those concepts. And the speech is the mental speech, the word. And then there is the body, the mental body, which is uh, manomaya atma, yes? the atman made out of mind. And there is a life within that Manomaya Purusha or Manomaya Atma. And this is um, on the mental level. And then we move to the supramental level and all of them are present even there on the overmental and beyond, I would not say supramental, because in, for the supramental level we would like to, to present another more subtle view on these faculties. And I will speak in a minute about that. But on the overmental level, you can see that on each level, actually, on the higher mind level, intuition, overmind, uh, supramental overmind, you will see on all these level by level that these faculties are present. And that was the description from Savitri that I read to you. Uh, these are from those higher realms of consciousness and the faculties are present there. On that level, the vision will become a drishti, a revelation. Uh, shrotram, the hearing, shruti, becomes an inspirational knowledge or understanding. Uh, the speech itself becomes paravak, the supramental speech. Uh, the intention of the divine to manifest himself here in this world in a particular way, yeah, as his chit shakti, that is the power of his word. And the mind itself becomes the super mind, the mind of unity and oneness. So, and the life force is that the living being lives together with all the faculties. So they are not yet spelled out and translated in terms of manifestation, but they are already present within the supramental consciousness. This is an important um, kind of vision for us because we are dealing with consciousness usually in a very abstract terms in psychological way uh, we are trying to explain what is consciousness how awareness works what is this awareness and we omit these major faculties and when we realize purusha of liberation or separation of purusha from prakriti our unborn consciousness from our embodied state uh, we realize it first of all as witness witness that means the one who sees, who sees the prakriti, who sees what is happening, who is witnessing, sensing, and, um, and understanding. So the, all three faculties are here, three major faculties of seeing, hearing, and touch. And Sri says there are only three major approaches to reality, seeing, hearing, and touch. So how did they come into play? Where do they come? From one consciousness, these faculties are born. Aitareya describes it as the faculties inherent in the Purusha, 
which was manifested by Atman, by the self, for the sake of manifestation, and that Purusha was sacrificed, that these faculties could come down into the into the fallen self, into the night, and start building our evolutionary, building our bodies here, these bodies which embody these faculties. Uh, that's why we all have sight, we all have hearing. So we share the universal faculties of the universal Purusha, though we are inbuilt in the individual forms. So if I put the question, and that was my major question, where they are coming from, what is hearing, what is seeing, what is really happening when we are seeing and hearing, what is the difference between them, what is the difference between thinking in different way, uh, different levels of thinking, different uh, types of the minds from the lowest um, sensual mind towards uh, the highest supramental way of thinking, then you will see all the gradations of all these major faculties are there playing in a particular way. So if how Sri Aurobindo beautifully describes manas, manas is the faculty of thinking, as the major faculty of holding, concentrating consciousness upon any image of things, and holding it within the realm of consciousness to perceive it and to know it, to identify oneself with it. So the major faculty of manas would be of holding, concentrating, and from here, as Kenna would describe, the sankalpa is maintained by uninterrupted memory consciousness. Memory itself is the uh, activity of consciousness which manifests uh, the major mental uh, function to hold on to something, to have uninterrupted movement of activities. So this movement of activities in time has to be connected, has to be mm, coherent. And for that, the mind plays its role. It holds the image of things within a particular context and adds to it. And so mind develops different types of logic. Logic is step-by-step -step development and seeing how things relate to one particular picture. It gathers the mosaic of all pictures into one picture and holds it there. This is the major faculty of the mind. Now, I'm trying to deconstruct these terms for us to see what is behind them, because we usually use the mind in a very vague sense. We think we know what is mind and how thoughts operate, but we usually don't really know. So we try to mentally <laughs> deconstruct it. Of course, it's a mental exercise in a way. And you know, Shubindu, what Shubindu says on the mind, he says that he stopped trusting the mind when he saw that the mind can do anything and prove anything, which is very different from Hegel. Hegel says he trusts the mind because mind can arrive and criticize its own arrivals so it can always um, readjust itself and find its own errors and because of that he can trust the mind and it's exactly because of that Sri Aurobindo cannot trust the mind <laughs> because there is a higher consciousness and mind is only a faculty of consciousness which plays a particular role to hold the image of things for the sake of knowing or identifying with oneself and the knowledge is only possible through this identification. There is only one type of knowledge, and that is knowledge by identity. The rest is all approximation to this absolute knowledge of, by identity. So here I just stopped with the mind. I can't go through all of them because it requires a lot of time. But Mind and sight are somehow connected. And if you study Sri Aurobindo Savitri, you will see that he never associates the mind with hearing. 
he always associates the mind with seeing, seeing, viewing, uh, light, mind, light, they go together. And on the other side, we have the word, the hearing, the comprehension, understanding, and so on. So I wanted to dig deeper into this uh, in our research. We did this research for several years, for actually for a decade or more in the University of Human Unity in Auroville. There was a whole group studying these faculties in the Upanishadic way and Sri Aurobindo's um, integral yoga. So uh, what we uh, discovered that behind these, major faculties, which we know as mind, thinking, as seeing, hearing, speaking, there are uh, activities or operations of the secret operations of consciousness, which are higher and do not have those definitions of them seeing, thinking, and so on. And these are the, Sri speaks of, of them in this way, there are secret operations in us of our subconscious and superconscious selves which precede this action, but of these we are not aware in our surface being, and therefore for us they do not exist. If we knew of them, our whole conscious functioning would be changed. And that is most probably the reason why we do not know about these secret operations which manifest the mental faculty, the seeing faculty, the hearing, and so on. Because if we would know about them, we would not fulfill our function here. We would not evolve in this gradual way. We would not build the body's organs necessary for these faculties to reach out. So here, this, this idea of that we should not be aware of our faculties, secret operations, because our functioning would change, and it should not change in this evolution of, uh, of consciousness. So these are the major four operations or secret essential operations of consciousness described by Sri Aurobindo in the Kena Upanishad. They are taken from Aitare Upanishad. There is the whole list given of these major faculties, which are representing one particular major faculty of Prajnana, and I will speak about it in a minute. Uh, so, Samjnana. Samjnana, Sri defines it as the essential sense. Uh, everything begins with vibration or movement the original kshobha, or disturbance. If there is no movement of conscious being, it can only know its own pure static existence. Without vibration or movement of being in consciousness, there can be no act of knowledge, and therefore sense. Without vibration or movement of being in force, there can be no object of sense. We are talking about the highest, the beginning of the beginnings, the consciousness force, Chit Shakti, moves in, uh, the being moves in knowledge, in the light of knowledge, and it produces sense. The being moves in force and it produces the object of sense. These two movements, without these movements, nothing is possible. Without the vibration or movement of being in consciousness, there can be no act of knowledge. So this is being moving in consciousness, produces the act of knowledge and thus sense. Without vibration or movement of being in force, there can be no object of sense. That object, that very object which we perceive, which we look at, our being, embodied state, all the things around, all the physical world, is the object of sense. Movement of conscious being as knowledge, becoming sensible of itself as movement of force, 
in other words, the knowledge separating itself from its own working to watch that and to take it into itself again by feeling, this is the basis of universal samjnana. It is true both for our internal and external operations. It is true for all operations of consciousness, physical, vital, mental, supramental and transcendental. The consciousness, the movement of being in, in knowledge, in consciousness, separates itself from its own workings as movement of being in force, which manifests the object of sense, in order to perceive it in you, to take it in you into itself. And that creates that embodied consciousness. That is the paradox of our of our existence here. It's actually the same paradox which um, Ulrich was talking about in, uh, in his presentation on the, on the physics and quantum mechanics. Yeah, that the consciousness is inherent with the object at the same time, that's why we can know anything and everything, because we arrive at the knowledge which we already intrinsically possess. It is already there. It's only a play of consciousness, perceiving it as if it is discovering it in you. And this is the basis for some jnana. Some jnana, by the way, consciousness. Conscious is exactly the same term, yes? Some together jnā realize oneself. No, no totally oneself. So this is the knowledge by identity. Shobindo beautifully describes this knowledge. I become anger by a vibration of conscious force acting as nervous emotion and I feel the anger that I have become by another movement of conscious force acting as light of knowledge. I am conscious of my body because I have become the body that the same force of conscious being which has made this form of itself this presentation of its workings knows it in that form, in that presentation. I can know nothing except what I myself am. If I know others, it is because they are also myself, because my self has assumed these apparently alien presentations as well as that which is nearest to my own mental center. All sensation, all action of sense is thus the same in essence, whether external or internal, physical or psychical. This is the profound action of consciousness, which is viewing itself, its own workings, as if it was new to it but it uh, rediscovers. That's why what, whatever we discover, the knowledge we discover, we already discover it from within, as it were. We already knew it. It is there waiting for us to be rediscovered. And this manifested phenomenal world, the phenomena, this is the phenomena basically, is helping us to rediscover that intrinsic truth and to bring it into manifestation. Samjnana is the contact of consciousness with an image of things by which there is a sensible possession of it in its substance. Sensible possession of it in its substance. Conscious possession of it recognizing it or sensing it, its substance, its being. If prajnana can be described as the outgoing of apprehensive consciousness to possess its object in conscious energy, to know it as such, 
Samjnana can be described as inbringing movement of apprehensive consciousness, which draws the object placed before it back to itself, so as to possess it in conscious substance, to feel it. These definitions require dwelling. They are profound. They are for meditation. They are the keys to our to unlock our inner consciousness, how our inner consciousness operates. So these two movements of apprehensive cognition, one is in bringing in order to identify oneself with it and to possess it in, in uh, its conscious substance, and the other is outgoing of apprehensive consciousness to know it as such. So first to know it as oneself and other is to know it as such are two simultaneous movements of these secret operations of consciousness. They are all necessary for us because they will be defining those operations of the mind, seeing, hearing, speaking later. Later we will see how they are related. Prajnana is the consciousness which holds an image of things before it as an object with which it has to enter into relations and possess by apprehension an analytic and synthetic cognition. We want to know ourselves objectively. We want to objectively view ourselves and our values and our truth and our being. And this is the movement towards manifestation. By the way, Mother describes this need of the Supreme, uh, which caused him, which made him create this world, was that he wanted to see himself objectively, to know himself in detail, not subjectively, not in his total supreme identity, but in unity. He wanted to rediscover himself in all the details, to see himself objectively. And that is the movement of this Prajnana. By the way, uh, Aitareya beautifully describes that all these faculties, Samjnana, Majnana, Vijnana, Prajnana, Meda, Drishti, Dhriti, Matir, Manisha, Jyutik, Smritik, Sankalpa, Krato, Raso, Kamo, Vasha, Iti, Sarvani, Evaitani, Prajnana, Syanama, Dheyani, Bhavanti. All these faculties, Samjnana and the rest, the whole long list, are nothing but the faculties of one Prajnana. Prajnana, which wants to view oneself objectively and to enter into this apprehensive and analytic and synthetic cognition with oneself, which manifests the worlds. And there are two more, Vijnana, which is original comprehensive. If we had two apprehensive cognitions, now we have two comprehensive. Vijnana is the original comprehensive consciousness, which holds an image of things in its essence, totality, parts and properties. It is the original, spontaneous, true and complete view of it, which belongs properly to the supermind, and of which mind has only a shadow in the highest operations of the comprehensive intellect. So all comprehending relations between all the possible um, details of manifestation. All the subjects and objects are related in a meaningful fashion. Everything knows how to be in relation to anything else. This is a fundamental um, characteristic of consciousness. It holds together the stars. Why the stars are held together? Why this computer stands on the table and plays its role sending the electrical signal over the space to another shore, to another continent where people can have connection with me He is sitting in this room. Why these books are on the table, this lamp is emitting light, 
everything knows how to coexist, how the, everything knows how to be together in a meaningful, comprehensive way. So all these relations are provided by one particular movement of or operation, secret operation of consciousness, which uh, Upanishads call the Vijnana. And there is Ajnana, one more. Ajnana is the operation by which consciousness dwells on an image of things so as to govern and possess it in power. We need to influence things. We have to interact. And that capacity of consciousness to dwell on the image of things as to govern and possess it in power is important comprehensive faculty of consciousness. Why comprehensive? Because it, it expresses myself in the comprehensive way with other things. I cannot do with things which are not meant to be kind of used for some purpose. I can use them only for the purpose they could be used. I can use them misuse them, abuse them also in a particular way. So all that kind of set of possibilities of relations between things is already determined. And that's why my action upon them can be of only a particular function. And that particular function is that comprehensive dwelling as to possess and govern things in power. I cannot, for example, fly with the book. I can fly only in the airplane, but not in the book. <laughs> so, or, or because the book I can read, I cannot read the airplane, yeah? unless it is, of course, a figure of speech. And so on. So these, these are the major faculties of consciousness operations, which are standing behind our mind, sight, hearing, and speaking. And all of them, and you can recognize them, that behind them, Ajnana is the self-expression which is becoming logos or the word and expressing one's wish. And uh, Vijnana is more understanding, comprehending all the relations between subjects and objects, which is holding in a comprehensive unity the thing that's like a space or hearing which understands hearkening to all the relations, recognizing their needs and their relations. Um, some jnana is more like the mind, which is in bringing and holding the image of things in order for us to identify ourselves with it and, um, and recognize it. And prajnana is like, like the seeing, seeing objectively the the world and the object of sense. So to know it as such, to see it objectively, to see it separately uh, from us, um, independently from our own being, is this major faculty of prajna. Here I stop. I already spoke quite a bit and open uh, uh, these uh, questions and answers session. We have 10 minutes. And you have a couple questions down there if you want to take a look in. If anybody sure. else has questions, um, you can you can raise your hand. Uh, oh, actually, we don't think we have that function on it, but uh, you can type it in the Q&A or put it in the, uh, in the chat and we'll catch it. Yes. Uh, how does one develop these to tap into the subtle channels rather than be limited with the average, very busy mind? Yeah, there are there are ways of doing it. By the way, we developed the whole approach to the development of these faculties, and we even tried to exercise them in the our, our university. We created the curriculum for the development of the faculties. We believe that the future education depends on the development of these faculties. So instead of teaching people how we see the world and in giving information of what we discovered, we could uh, teach uh, how to use the faculties of consciousness, how to see, how to speak, and to be conscious in speech, how to think, different ways of thinking, um, feel, how to feel, 
uh, emotions, uh, how to be emotionally educated. We don't even pay attention to these subjects nowadays. How to speak, how to use speech, poetic speech, oratory skills, and so on. So this was also a very big um, topic, which um, maybe I will just jump into one, just to slide through this beautiful um, PowerPoint presentation uh, on the faculties of consciousness. So you can see here some of these ideas, how to develop your thinking, what is required, uh, concentration is required to train one's mind to be focused, concentrated, to be silent. Silencing the mind is a very powerful tool and very necessary uh, capacity of the mind to be silent and to be concentrated and focused and attentive. These are the, the trainings we have to undergo to, uh, to uh, develop our faculties. Brainwave activity control, it's a new um, subject, which is quite interesting. You put a particular thing on your brain and, and generate different uh, waves, alpha waves, uh, beta waves, de delta waves, and so on. Um, thought management by will, it's also a very interesting thing to select thoughts which you want to dwell on and to cast others. Um, thinking frameworks we have to understand also what is rational thinking logical dialectical analytic synthetic pragmatic strategic tactic and so on divergent holistic conceptual symbolic creative intuitive and even more you know, beyond um, so also memory development memory is a power of the mind uh, so we can develop our visual, oral memory. This is a capacity of that holding or imbringing apprehensive uh, image yeah, um, uh, into ourselves in order to establish with it a contact. Um, widening the mental consciousness, of course, to improve the capacity of the memory, because the memory is not really memorizing, it's more having vaster view on things, where things find their place and relations, and that could improve the memory. Speed in thinking also can be dealt with. Synthetic semantics, archetypal thinking, states of mind, openness, receptivity, flexibility, plasticity of the mind, psychological approaches to knowledge, yeah, what kind of disciplines? Yoga, of course, discipline of concentration, pratyahara, dharana, dhyana from yoga sutras can be developed. Meditation, widening, heightening, deepening movement of consciousness, mindfulness, vipassana, and so on. Um, mathematics, Vedic mathematics, chess, a very good game to play in the mind, and so on. And I took only the mind. You can see the seeing has its own domains, hearing has its own. We have a question here if this wonderful presentation might be available to the uh, to the participants, if I can mail this out uh, sure. to them. Sure, sure. Okay, Most and we also them. have um, Aurelio is asking if your curriculum of the faculties are applicable for all ages or when ideally to start this education. Well, it, yes, it can be tailored for different ages and we can start it from the year one yeah, onwards because on each level or at each age you have all these faculties are being activated and being formulated and being exercised and trained. So training of the faculties, the earlier the better. 
Of course, there would be hearing and seeing. Hearing would be more prominent in the early age, yeah, as we know it. Yes, Aurelio is totally right. I remember how Aurelio was making with us this beautiful meditation when we sat in a verite in, in the circle together and we closed our eyes. And he says that, imagine that we are like in the womb of the mother. We are not yet born, but we already hear all the sounds our mother speaks, how others speak, all the sounds in outside, inside. We feel, we feel and hear this is already our, we don't see yet. Yeah? And that development is, uh, is at, at the beginning of our mm, life. And then when we are born for the first time, we see and we, we can't yet form the, what it is. And it takes time for us to recognize by seeing things, yes? We recognize them through hearing. You know, the child recognizes the mother by the voice, by the voice and the smell and touch, not by seeing. The child never saw the mother and so on. Of course, there are stages of development and one can uh, look at them more thoroughly. You have quite a few questions there that are building up. Vladimir, if you want to take a look. Yes. Um, if I know other, can you speak more of this, please? <clears throat> yes, I can know others only as myself. And this is an interesting thing. This is from the, that um, if I know others at all, it would be only as I know myself. And that is true. We cannot know anything or anybody other than through ourselves. There is a very beautiful anecdote from Zhuangzi. There was a great master from Taoism, uh, Zhuangzi. And when he was um, walking in the park with his um, uh, disciple, uh, then the fish jump out of the water and he said, how happily the fish is jumping out of the water. And uh, his disciple told him, but you are not the fish. You do not know whether it is happily jumping or not. And he looked at him and he said, but you are not me. You do not know what I know. So he returned to him the same argument that we are separated beings. And this is quite an interesting thing. Of course, he knows how fish feels in the deeper consciousness. By the way, there is the whole project of uh, Stanislav Grof, if you know, yes, Beyond the Brain, where he examines the embryo life and he discovered these stages of the embryonic life where we start as a fish, the embryo is exactly as the embryo of the fish. And then we develop slowly into the embryo of the animals and the embryo of the human being. So on each level, this embryo within nine months has correspondence with the whole evolution on earth, starting from fish and ending with human beings. Of course, if we have that consciousness, we inherit it we know in the body already how it feels we can identify if we are open enough and flexible enough if i know others it is only as i know them closer to myself or through myself as i feel only through knowledge by identity there is no other way to know there's only one being which has this consciousness of knowing everything could it be said that our ego and psychic being operate naturally with different operations of consciousness? Naturally with different operations of consciousness. Different, the word is confusing me here, but otherwise they operate by the same faculties of consciousness. Our ego, our nature, and our psychic being will operate by the same seeing, hearing, speaking, thinking, yes. As Sri Bindu says, it is identical to our psychical and physical operations, to our inner and outer. These are the faculties which operate uh, within and without. 
And there is, there is no other consciousness. How else it would manifest itself? Yes. I, I wonder, uh, well, I was just wondering with that question, if perhaps the faculties of consciousness that the ego works through tends to be more on the outer external uh, level, whereas the psychic opens us to the more subtle use um, and access to the more subtle faculties of consciousness. Absolutely. That is, um, well, they are just operating on different levels, yes, and that's why we distinguish them as the outer kind of indrias, indrias turned without or indrias turned within. But these are the same indrias wherever they are turned. If they are turned within, they reach to the deeper inner levels of being and consciousness, and there they operate um, on a different ground that they are operating on the physical ground. But the the same operation will be maintained still. <laughs> and that is interesting. Yeah, um, yeah thank you for this, Yaranda, uh, for this clarification. What about our body organs, like heart, lungs? Are they also some ways of faculties of consciousness? Definitely, they are. There's a little mic at the bottom of your screen that says mute, and just click on that. And there we go. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I think uh, I, I typed not correctly. Mm. It was meant that you said at the beginning, uh, the, our body did not have organs. Right. Well, like a monocellular organism doesn't have organs yet. It wants to develop them. Yeah? It wants to, to, to communicate. It wants to reach out, to touch. It wants to, to, to hear, to understand, to comprehend, to relate. But it doesn't have yet hands. It doesn't have yet eyes. And slowly, gradually, step by step, consciousness captured within this cell develops the all the organs which which come into existence and now consciousness can operate in the physical world connecting the deeper levels to the surface i hope it answers partially the, um jessel yes very interesting president would be great to study and of course if vladimir could take a separate session uh, cause on it. Yes, it's a big topic. It's a huge topic and it requires each faculty of consciousness to look into quite uh, intensely and extensively because there are many topics behind this kind of list of topics. And it would be a very interesting exercise to do. Maybe one day we will organize this course and uh, dive deeper into it because it's an exploration of our own capacity. And there is one more thing about it is that the moment we start viewing our faculties of consciousness instead of the domains which they manifest in, instead of the field in which they manifest, we immediately step back into a deeper consciousness because we view how they operate we do not view what they do outside because we are not aware of the faculties of consciousness. We are aware of what is happening outside with things. We, we are aware that we see, that we hear, that we react, touch, but we do not see how we touch, how we are aware, how we see. We do not view our own uh, functionality. And the, for that, we need to step back and that stepping back brings us to the poise of the spirit within us from which we could view how these faculties function as um, ken upanishad would say it is not by the speech that you can speak about the brahman but by brahman that you speak it is not by the side that you can see the brahman but because of brahman or by brahman that you see it's not by the hearing that you can hear the Brahman. It's by Brahman that you hear. The Brahman, the spirit, is present in hearing, seeing. This very functionality of simple seeing, hearing, speaking is already representing the spirit here in the action, in manifestation. So when we want to know Brahman as an object, it's impossible. 
because it is that operation within which by which we want to know anything <laughs> so stepping back and viewing how they work how they function gives us a new leverage a new poise from which we can know better how we function and educate these faculties so are these faculties present in non-human life forms absolutely they are present everywhere they are pervading the whole universe as shirobindo says indriyas are infinite they are pervading the universe that's why they are present in all beings all beings have sight have uh, co apprehensive and comprehensive cognition that's why we have this universe in this form um now now we are trying to understand the supermind is it the purusha who is actually striving to comprehend this as prajnana Purusha is the person, person which was manifested according to Aitareya by Atman, the self-conscious spirit being. The self-conscious being manifested the Purusha for the sake of manifesting himself, the spirit, into the into this prajnana to see oneself objectively so it needed these steps and purusha was one of those steps in the post vedic literature we speak about purusha and atman as synonyms already but in indian tradition they are different atman is the self awareness of the spirit of the being brahman atman is self awareness of brahman let us say and purusha is that formation by that self awareness which was needed for manifestation for spelling out in time and space all the details infinite details of that infinite divine being and we can see that in the physical world this infinity is maintained there are no same pebbles on the shore there are no same leaves on the tree you will not find the, the same leaf on the trees you will not find the same fingerprints everything is different infinitely different and i was thinking why it is different infinitely that there is nothing same in this physical world and it is because of the space and we come to quantum mechanics again because the space is infinitely uh, infinitely minute and infinitely large so we can move infinitely into the vastness and into the minuteness of the spirit there is no end in neither direction and this is creating the absolute variety of infinity uh, here in all the objects of sense so when born lacking the faculty of sight or hearing thus developing the other skills compensate yeah yeah this is a very interesting question by the way uh, what is happening to those who do not have uh, physical sight or physical hearing or those who, who are colorblind have you seen more maybe these movies on youtube you just youtube them colorblinded people when they were given the the uh, the glasses which allow them to see the colors you have to to hear what they say the the old man the older man like 60 years old he he for the first time he saw the colors because this this was a technology developed and they presented for his birthday these glasses he was crying he said it is it is so beautiful the world the world of colors it's like three dimensional he said three dimensional it seems that when we don't see colors we do not see totally three dimensions it's like a flat you know gray one gray thing so he saw the dimensions finally of the space so these are of course um, 
um, profound questions, how we compensate. Can we compensate? Yes, we can compensate. And we do compensate. In the inner, in the inner being, we see those objects. We create the images of them, of course. The blind people see within. They, they are not blinded within. They just don't have the organ of sight or hearing. Yes. Yeah, it's a bigger question and um, we cannot lack the aspect of consciousness. We consciousness is operating by all these faculties together. This is the point. We may lack some physical ability because some damage of the eyes or some physical damage or of the ears or some other nervous damage of the touch and so on. Yes, we can have that lack in the manifested world, but in the subtle realm, they are active and they can compensate and recreate the world in our imagination. Is this definition of consciousness was defined, developed by a single person who it was developed around 1000 BC? I don't think so. I think this is the whole culture. It's the whole Vedic culture of Vedic rishis, Upanishadic rishis who are who were working on this, and who translated the Vedic uh, paradigm of uh, knowledge, which was very different, which was more universal in terms of more individual perception of consciousness. So we have that shift from the Rigveda, where the faculties of consciousness are represented by the universal godheads like Indra, Ashvins, Vayu, and so on, Surya. These are the universal godheads. Surya is the godhead of supramental consciousness and so on. So Indra is the godhead of the divine mind. Brihaspati is the lord of the divine word. These are the powers of the divine, which later were translated in terms of seeing, hearing, speaking, thinking. And these are becoming the devatas, the gods of the Upanishads. So in the Upanishads, Upanishads are becoming closer to our understanding of consciousness. So that's why we we tap into them rather than into the Rigvedic vision of consciousness, because it would be even more uh, kind of uh, universal and farther away from our understanding. But we may arrive at it also through Upanishads. Upanishads is a very good gate towards the Vedic understanding of consciousness. Great, I will stop here. I answered all the questions. Yeah, and I think too, Vladimir, we had quite a few people in the chat box um, asking for more information, more classes to be developed in this area. So I just put uh, my email um, down there, rade at lagrassecenter.com. If uh, this is an area that Vladimir has been wanting to develop courses around, and if you are interested in um, helping in this this initiative and helping to develop these uh, courses, just feel free to, to email me or you can put your uh, uh, email in there too, Vladimir, and they can uh, sure. email you directly. But this is this is really one of the uh, foundations of the Lagrasse Center is to develop courses in this area. Um, of course, the other other major uh, foundation is developing courses around the twelve qualities or the twelve aspects that are uh, represented by the mother's symbol. So, um, so yeah. yes, this is something that would be hu hugely helpful for all of us to have more information on. Yeah, we call it even uh, uh, this this particular approach technologies of consciousness. It's more technological, yes. Whereas the the varieties or the qualities of our soul uh, is more about the value system. And if these two are put together, then we have a holistic approach to education. And I'm just trying to get down an email here. Thank you. We'll be in contact. And then just uh, before you go, I just had a couple announcements, but thank you, Vladimir, so very, very much uh, for this. And we're just really glad to see that others are appreciating uh, this topic and the importance of these faculties of, of consciousness. 
um, we have been on a kind of concurrent uh, program called All Life is Yoga. We have been hosting a series uh, on Ayurveda, which is the ancient uh, healing system from India. And last week we had Steven Heinberger who discussed the integration of Ayurveda with Vedic astrology and the Vedic birth chart. So I wanted to announce that tomorrow night, Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern time. So those of you that may be from India, that's the middle of the night, we apologize. But certainly West Coast, uh, three o'clock, uh, East Coast, six o'clock tomorrow night, we are hosting Maria Greer, who will share how she integrates Ayurveda with yoga, asana, and pranayama. And she is a graduate of the Ayurvedic Institute of New Mexico and also founder of the New Mexico School of, Yo of Yoga. And then next Saturday, when we would normally be doing a new perspectives, we will do uh, an all life is yoga program with Kashyapa Fisher. So this will be next Saturday, August 7th at 10. And he is also a graduate of the Ayurvedic Institute of New Mexico, and he will present his thoughts on the future of Ayurveda. Um, Kashyapa is founder of Arogya, which is a Panchakarma clinic uh, in New Mexico and a center for advanced training in clinical Ayurveda. So we've got just some, some uh, real experts, renowned experts in this field of Ayurveda and um, hope that you can continue on this journey tomorrow night and then again next uh, Saturday. And any of these that you miss, I put our website down there, uh, lagrassecenter.com. We are also always uh, both new perspectives and all life is yoga recording these and they can be found on our, our website. So um, once again, we thank you Vladimir very much and attendees for, for coming and for your wonderful questions and, and staying engaged throughout this talk. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Namaste.